Hi guys, welcome back to Undressing the Issue. I'm Julia, and the issue I wanted to undress today is actually not very sexy, but it's about triggers and um, how triggers play into what's going on right now with this pandemic, with COVID-19 and, you know, with quarantining and all of these safer at home orders and all of this good stuff. So let's dive in, shall we? So first and foremost, triggers. Trigger is a word that I feel like has been thrown around quite a bit, especially with, you know, this PC culture and uh, just it's all over the place. And as a therapist, I hear it all the time from my patients is I find this triggering. I find that triggering. I triggered so-and-so. Um, I am a trigger. How about that? I've had patients who've come in and told me that I am a trigger for them because whatever. I'm female. I'm blonde. I'm tall. I, I have green eyes. I have no idea why, but for whatever reason, I can be a trigger too. But anyway, what are triggers? What are they exactly? What do we mean when we say I'm triggered? So I look at triggers as cues. It's a cue from your body that you feel unsafe for some reason, whether it's emotionally unsafe, physically unsafe, whatever it is, it's a cue. It's your body going, um, excuse me, excuse me, you need to run for your life. <laughs> like you need to escape or you need to start swinging. So triggers, these cues are coming from your fight or flight instinct. We've all probably heard about it, fight, flight, or freeze. And basically this is this cool little part of our brain that comes from way back before we evolved into upright homo sapiens. Um, it was a survival mechanism and it was basically like a warning system that came from our brain when we were potentially in danger, when we were in harm's way that caused us to seek safety by either fighting for our lives, for our safety, getting whatever the danger was away from us, defeating it or running away from it. Or in some cases we would freeze I'm sure you've heard of like playing dead <laughs> if you're ever being attacked by a large animal with the hope that they're going to go away. I mean, that's kind of the whole idea of freeze. Um, but it's this old survival mechanism that we, even through all of the stages of evolution, it's never left us. And when it is stimulated by something, that's what gives us this cue of, uh-oh, I might be in danger. I might be at risk of being hurt or suffering in some way. Now with triggers, tr the, the, the tough part is with this, this old mechanism in our brain is that it cannot differentiate between a current danger or a danger that we experienced in our past, aka a trauma which is why sometimes, for example, when my patient told me a couple of weeks ago, you're a trigger for me because you're female, you're blonde, and that's a problem. It's not because I'm a danger to her. It was because she had had a bad experience in the past with a blonde female who actually had betrayed her and had basically um, hurt her very deeply. So I am a reminder of a past cue, if that makes sense, of a past danger, even though I have no intentions of betraying her or harming her in any way, but because I somehow am a reminder of somebody else who did, her brain is going, uh-oh, uh-oh, warning, flashing red lights, all of that good stuff. So her fight or flight instinct instantly was set off. Not because of something that was happening in the moment, not because she was in any danger in that moment, but because of a danger that she went through in the past. And that's 
That's unfortunately how this mechanism works. It cannot differentiate. And oftentimes when we do feel triggered by something, it is coming from something in our past. But sometimes, unfortunately, like right now, it is something in our present. We are currently in a crisis, in a state of emergency, especially here in California. Um, We have this virus that's spreading all over the world and into our neighborhoods, into our homes, into our stores, into our hospitals, and it's fucking terrifying. So all of these cues, this fight or flight instinct, it's going to be on high alert right now. And that's unfortunate. So part of this is this feeling of being unsafe. And why is this feeling coming about with a pandemic? Well, first off, duh, it is unsafe. It is unsafe. It's unsafe to go and you know, shake hands with somebody you don't know or go take a trip to another country right now, get on an airplane. It's unsafe to be in tight quarters with a large group of other people. It is unsafe. That is real. But why is it so triggering? Well, first off, um, if you turn on your TV, if you go on the internet, this COVID-19 stuff is fucking everywhere. It's everywhere. You can find coverage of it around the clock on multiple channels. You can't get away from it. There is no way to not know that it's going on right now. So when you're inundated with something, when it's constantly pushed in front of you, you're going to, your your fear response, that fight or flight, it's going to be just constantly going off. So... We're in that right now. Obviously, that is going to be triggering in itself because we are being saturated with coverage of this. We're saturated with people, you know, giving us information or explaining it, all of these doctors that are being interviewed. And, you know, we're looking at all of these scientific data announcements and analyses and you name it. I mean, it, it, you can't get away from it. When you're, when that's happening and you're like, oh my God, I'm trapped. Like this is, this is real. It's everywhere. It's all around me. It's, it's frightening. And that's legit. I think part of also, part of why this is triggering as well is because this is serious. (laughs) Like this isn't, you know, just a head cold or, you know, a little bout of diarrhea or some gas. Like this is serious and it's life threatening for a lot of people. No, it may not be life-threatening for you if you were to um, catch this, but you don't know whether it will or it won't. And that's a huge risk. And that in itself also is scary. Another reason why this is triggering, and I think this is a really important one, is that this pandemic has been completely disruptive. It has changed something, if not everything, for most people at this time. A lot of people are unable to work or they have to work differently or they're scared going to work. Um, People are having to take precautionary measures to protect themselves, to, you know, cover their faces, to wash their hands, to... Um, see their doctors, to to make sure that they're on top of this. This is not your normal day-to-day. This is affecting every single one of us, even for those who have not been infected in some way. And when daily life gets interrupted on such a level, when there's something that's so invasive that literally every single human being, and I would say the majority of all of the human beings on our planet are having to change their day-to-day in some way over something that they can't see, that they can't control, that is going to be triggering. That is going to definitely trigger your fight-or-flight response. You're going to want to 
get away from this. You're going to want to do something to protect yourself. In my opinion, that's the fight part of this. Or you're going to freeze. You're, you're going to disassociate. You're going to not know what to do with yourself. You're, you're going to be kind of stuck or feel stuck with this. So I think those are the main three reasons, in my opinion, why this whole pandemic is really setting off a lot of people's anxieties and fears and people who are already prone to anxiety, who are already anxious, you know who you are. This just puts them at another level and their coping ability is already compromised. And so you put this on top of that and it just gets a hell of a lot harder. So those are my three reasons for why this is so triggering is it's everywhere. It's super serious and it's disruptive. It's completely disruptive. It is changing our lives. So what I really want to touch on is basically triggers. If we look at it in terms of our physiology, our bodies, when we get triggered, when we go into that fight or flight thing, it's basically in our body, it looks the same as stress. And this is why we talk about how like trauma or having a lot of trauma in our past has offset our stress levels, our, you know, fight or flight response, and it can have um, an altering effect permanently on that. Now, stress affects everything. And stress, when it comes from this pandemic, can be for a number of reasons. Obviously, we're stressed about our health and the risks that this whole thing, this virus and the resulting complications and um, you know, the, the treatment or the lack thereof, or the limited access to testing or whatever else, it's stressful because it, it's our health on the line. Um, and that's something that we have to be concerned with all the time, obviously, but now there's an even greater threat to it. So that's one of the reasons why this is stressful. Another reason why this is stressful and why it's going to cause you to feel triggered is because it's also calling into question our resources. So our health is being threatened, as are our resources. Now, this one is multi-layered, the resource one. First off, if you can't work, if your job has been eliminated, at least you know, indefinitely for now, if you work in retail, if you work in food service as a server, bartender, um, you may be out of a job right now. If you do something else that's more of like a luxury that is some other type of service that's not considered essential, you may be out of business. This may cripple your livelihood for the time being which means now you're going to worry about paying your bills, paying for food, paying to keep a roof over your head. You know, we all have obligations. We all have bills to pay. Money is something that is unfortunately a necessity. And if your access to earning it has now been eliminated because of this, it's going to raise your stress levels. This is a trigger, obviously. The other big stress source in all of this is, well, hold on, before I talk about that, the resource thing I need to circle back to because this is just, this is just ridiculous. I'm sure everybody has heard of the pandemonium that happened at all of our grocery stores and markets and um, people buying out all of the toilet paper, paper towels and Kleenex and Clorox wipes and hand sanitizers. And, you know, People just kind of went nuts and face masks and all of this and people just started hoarding it. And, you know, for somebody else who may have had limited access to these markets, who didn't get in while it was still available, now they don't have protection because other people got in and overbought selfishly. These are resources. Somebody decided to 
take more than they should have. And it wasn't just one somebody. It was a bunch of somebodies. And now other people who also need it have none. And certain people have more than they're going to be able to use in God knows how long. So this piece, I'm going to be honest, this really fucking chaps my ass. I heard an announcement yesterday that Costco is no longer accepting returns on toilet paper, paper towels, bottled water. So these assholes who bought this shit out and left none for others, couldn't share, God forbid, now realize that they don't need as much, there's nothing they can do with it because the supply is being replenished and now they want their money back. Well, what about the people who couldn't get it? And what about the people who may have gotten infected because they couldn't get access to masks and hand sanitizers and cleaning solution? Way to go, you asshole. That's on you. All right, I'm done. I'm getting off my soapbox. That shit really fucking pisses me off. I don't understand why. You get enough for yourself for a temporary period of time. Okay, fine. Buy three bottles. But you got to buy 20. You got to buy everything they have, the whole stock. Why? Okay, I'm done. Okay, now officially off my soapbox. Assholes, I'm done. Anywho. Stress, sources. We talked about health, the threat to our health, the threat to our resources. Um, I'm sure you guys are reading about how in hospitals there's only enough ventilators and uh, machinery and beds and staff and whatever else to service the massive influx of patients right now that our medical staff who are in the front lines are kind of overwhelmed right now. First off, I mean, (laughs) I can't say enough about all of the medical professionals right now out there who are on the front lines, who are risking themselves, who are giving their time and their effort and their energy to help those in need right now. I think that if you know somebody who works in a hospital, who is some type of a healthcare employee, a nurse, a doctor, some type of tech or staff, whatever it is, give them a big thank you. And when all this blows over, take them out to dinner because they deserve it. This is this is intense right now and they're on the front lines. So they deserve a lot of kudos and they deserve to be kind of uh, pampered after this. So, okay, I'm done. Resources, done. Next thing. Um, routine. I kind of talked a little bit about how this is disruptive, but you know, when anytime our routine is interrupted by anything, we tend to get a little bit emotionally imbalanced. Some people more than others. For those who thrive with routine, when it is broken, even if it is not completely derailed, but it is adjusted, this can throw people for a loop. And it could be scary. It could be dysregulating. It could mean that they have a hard time getting their bearings. They have a hard time being productive. They have a hard time taking care of themselves. And that causes stress. So, of course, being out of your routine, as most of us are right now, because this is a weird time we're in, you're probably going to be a little more sensitive than usual and feel a little more triggered than usual. Now, the other thing I want to talk about as far as triggers is, I guess, one of my triggers around COVID-19, and it's this mentality that I've been seeing quite a bit from a lot of people on social media, my patients, um, on TV, whatever else, and it's this mentality that I'm invincible. So nobody's invincible, You don't magically have immunity to COVID-19. So far, we haven't seen anybody who does. Um, We don't have a concrete treatment. We have some measures that we can take to reduce symptoms, but we don't have a solution. We don't have a cure. That's the reality. Nobody's invincible. 
every human being on this planet is susceptible to this. And I don't mind you thinking that, you know, I'm healthy. I take care of myself. I'm not as much, um, I'm not in danger as much as let's say a 96 year old person who is living in a nursing home who has all sorts of, you know, pre-existing health issues. You're right. You are not at that high of a risk. You're not in as much danger as the 96 year old. However, you still can get this and you don't know what it's going to do when you do get it or if you get it. I shouldn't say when I don't want everybody to get it. So this whole mentality of like, I'm invincible. I'm not going to get it. I'm still going to go out and be around large groups of people. I'm, you know, I'm going to completely disregard what I'm being advised to do to stay safe, to flatten the curve, to all of this kind of stuff. Well, you're not invincible. Actually, in my personal opinion, you're dumb and you're selfish. That's where I stand on it. Because even if you are going to weather this okay, and even if you were to catch this and be one of those lucky people that we've been hearing about who have minimal symptoms, what about those around you? Now you have the ability to infect somebody else and they may not weather this as well as you. And because you thought you were a fucking hero, now you may put somebody else's life in danger. And to me, that's selfish. So that part I don't like. I don't think we should, you know, wrap ourselves in saran wrap and go hide in our closets for the next month. But I also don't think we need to be making bad decisions and still, you know, going to crowded places, not washing our hands, not protecting ourselves, getting really close to other people. That's kind of where I stand on it. And, you know, it's... (sighs) I could get onto another soapbox right now, but I'm trying not to. To me, this is really parallel to the idiotic mentality behind (laughs) anti-vaccinating. You think that you don't need these vaccines. You think that your child is going to be perfectly fine without them. And maybe your child will, but that doesn't mean that your child's best friend or classmate will. And because you didn't take those measures, you are now endangering other children. But that's an aside. And I don't know where anti-vaxxers stand on this COVID-19 thing. Maybe they're burning sage and, you know, putting their favorite essential oils in their diffusers and, you know, hugging a tree and attending their regular drum circles. I don't fucking know. But... I I think this is kind of a wake up call for all of us that, you know, modern medicine has come a long way, but it's still not foolproof, but we shouldn't disregard the advancements that we've made. Okay, I'm done. Last soapbox I'm getting on. My apologies. Kind of. Not really. Okay. So stress. We talked about triggers. What are triggers? Why is the pandemic triggering? What are the stressors during this pandemic that are leading us to feel more triggered at this time? And I wanted to touch on why stress is important to talk about. And really it's because we started talking about the physiological response and that is elevated cortisol levels. And we know you can read this all over the place in scientific journals and magazines. You can find it everywhere. But the research shows us that when we have elevated stress levels, it elevates our cortisol levels. And when our cortisol levels are elevated for an extended period of time, and we can have little momentary spikes, but when it's kind of ongoing the way it has been during this time, Higher cortisol levels mean lower immune system functioning. It can impact your immune system negatively. And when we're already in this position where our immune system may need to step up and fight something that could be pretty nasty, to compromise it any further is not a good idea. We're going to need that bad boy if we are exposed. So, I feel like this is why it's so important for people to really manage their stress levels very wisely right now. I've been telling a lot of my patients that the best thing you can do is take really good care of yourself right now. 
get your exercise. I know you can't go to the gym, but you can roll out a yoga mat in your living room and put on a YouTube video. You can take a walk around the block. You can do some push-ups and some sit-ups in your house. Like there's still ways for you to move your body, which is good for you. You should be getting a regular amount of sleep. You should be going to sleep the your normal time, waking up at your normal time, showering, eating normally, all of that. It's not, you know, it's it's hard to stay in that when you're not in your old you know, in your old grind, going to work at the same time or waking up at the same time because you have to be somewhere. If you're self-quarantining or if you're quarantining because you're mandated to, you're at home. And yes, that may be different for you, but the more you can continue taking care of yourself the way you always have, the better off you're going to be. Your body needs that. But I think the biggest thing that can help with sort of the pandemonium and the the fear and the anxiety and all of the triggering is I think there's a need for us to change our mindset about this. You know, this is the first time I think in my lifetime, well, outside of 9-11 and certain other events where, you know, the entire world seems to have been brought together. Everybody's in this collectively and we need to be taking on more of a collective mentality. It's not just about each man for himself and I have to protect myself. Really, in protecting myself, I'm protecting the people around me, people I may come into contact with, people who may be vulnerable. And I think that that has to be something that we have to start really focusing on during this time is that it's not just about me. It's about me and the person next to me and the person next to them and my neighbors and, you know, their families and everybody else. Because unfortunately, whether you like your neighbors or the person next to you or not, we're in it together. We're all going through it. I also think that our mindset needs to be changed from the I'm invincible can't happen to me to I'd rather be safe than sorry. You know, if I can, if I have the opportunity to voluntarily self-quarantine, work from home, avoid crowded places, um, not expose myself unnecessarily beyond what I have to do, then I should do that. Not just for myself, but for everyone else that I may come into contact with. Um, I also think that this is a good time for people to take a self-care inventory. I'm hearing a lot about people who are at home and they're like going stir crazy. They don't know what to do with themselves. They are having a hard time keeping up with their hygiene. They're like, well, I'm in my pajama pants all day, you know, taking Zoom meetings, whatever else. So why do I need to shower? Um, I ate my food stash in the first two days of working from home. I uh, I stayed up and binged Netflix last night till three o'clock in the morning. Well, this is not something you normally do, or is it? I mean, where do you lack structure normally that you're having a hard time implementing it now in this extenuating cir- circumstance? I also think a lot of people need to really use strategies at this time. For those who are not used to working from home who now have to, I think this is a time where you've got to learn how to structure yourself, how to stay in a routine, how to stay in a pattern, how to hold yourself accountable and not just consider this, you know, paid fun employment (laughs) temporarily. Things still need to get done. The world still has to keep turning and, you know, we still have an economy even though it's declining, there's still services and products and companies that have to keep moving and functioning in this. So even though you're home, it's not like you're on vacation. You got to keep going and you've got to find ways to take care of yourself in the meantime as well. I think the biggest thing also, as far as using strategies at this time, yes, structure your time, give yourself a, a new normal, a new routine, but also relax you know, if you're working from home and whenever you're not doing work, you're watching the 24 hour live coverage of COVID-19 on a fucking loop. 
you know, you're not really resting. You're going from having to think about work to then worrying about what's happening with this. There isn't really downtime in that. And you need that because again, you don't want to compromise your immune system with elevated stress levels and elevated cortisol levels. So you need to find the time to relax, just sit, breathe, get some rest, get some sleep. It's okay if you turn off the COVID-19 coverage or if you go past the articles online about the recent updates on COVID-19 and instead you look at pictures of puppies or you watch Bob's Burgers, that's a-okay. You can do that and you should do that because it's going to be calming for you. Also, the biggest thing is this is out of our control. But the best strategy you can employ right now is to focus on what you can control. You can control what you do day to day. You can control what time you wake up. You can control what you eat. You can control how you protect yourself, whether you take unnecessary trips out of your house, whether you um, expose yourself to other people that you haven't seen in a while, you know, just because you're bored you're lonely, you're going stir crazy, you have control over these things. So make decisions wisely. And I think the biggest thing is keep calm. (laughs) This is stressful. This is disruptive. Absolutely. We haven't seen anything like this where as a nation, we've had to practice social distancing, where we've had this pandemic that has been on this level since the Spanish flu in, what was that, 1918? I mean, that was 100 years ago. There isn't a whole lot of data (laughs) around whether that flattened the curve or not because it was fucking 1918. And the reality is we've come a long way with medical advancements, with science and research, and also with being able to track things. So, Just know people out there are working hard and hopefully this is going to pass. Hopefully we can get it under control so it doesn't continue spreading like wildfire so we can slow it down so that we can keep up with the treatment of it so that we can provide people with the resources that they need and the support they need. So keep calm. Things are happening. Movement is being made this is going to blow over eventually and hopefully it won't happen again and it won't happen to this degree. But in the meantime, the best thing you can do is take care of yourself. And if you are having a hard time, if you are having difficulty coping, you don't know how to contain this, you're getting overly stressed or anxious or you need other strategies, you need additional support, you know, therapists are doing sessions remotely. Yes, we're social distancing, but you know, you still can get the support that you need. Contact your therapist. I am running remote sessions every single day and get some of that. Get in on that. Calm yourself down. Help your immune system. Stay safe out there. Practice the social distancing. Don't assume you're invincible And hang on to some type of routine. Don't let yourself get completely derailed. And if you have any feedback, if you have any questions, comments, anything else you'd like me to touch on, as always, feel free to leave me feedback on my social media or go to undressingtheissue.com. I would love to hear from you. And stay safe out there. Please take care of yourselves. Be healthy. Be well. And uh, till next time, thanks for listening. Bye, guys.